Philip is one of Britain's leading historians of France and the Middle East, and in addition to his writing, he is a fellow of the Royal Historical Society, the Royal Society of Literature, the Institute of Historical Research, the Royal Asiatic Society, and co-founder of the Society for Court Studies, whose journal he edited for 20 years. But today, tonight, he's going to talk to us about Louis XIV and his gardens. So with no further ado, I will hand over to Philip. Philip. Good, good evening. Thank you, Madeline. And I'm talking tonight about a relatively unknown aspect of Louis XIV. He's more familiar to us as the conquering hero shown here by Charles Lebrun in 1668, the perfect master of his horse. Or here, 1673, in front of Maastricht as a Roman emperor crowned by victory. But in fact, gardening was one of his great passions when he wasn't at war. Let me quote a few diarists of his reign. The Marquis de Danjou wrote in 1695, when the king's no longer young, the king walked all day in his gardens where he is happier th than ever. It's one of the king's great passions. He is always ordering some beautification in the gardens. And he often walked in his gardens even at night sometimes even after midnight, if the moon was bright. Neither cold nor rain could keep the king indoors. February 1701, when he's over 60, Danjou wrote that despite the bad weather, the king went to walk at Trianon, where he is changing many things in the gardens. 20th of December one year, he walked all day in the gardens, though there was frost and ice, and his beloved dogs refused to go out. In fact, the king was the toughest animal in his court. And he was lucky, this passion for gardens was encouraged by a genius whom he found, André Le Nôtre, to give his full title, Jardinier Ordinaire du Roi, Dessinateur des Plans et Jardins du Roi, Contrôleur Général des Bâtiments, Arts et Manufactures de France. And Le Nôtre, was a loyal servant as well as a great gardener, and he called Louis XIV, and I quote, the greatest gardener in the world. And they agreed they didn't like a finite view. They created at Versailles a, gar a garden of multiple avenues. Here you see it in its early stages, 1669, avenues with perspectives stretching to the horizon, unfolding as the walker advanced from view to point to viewpoint. And they were helped by astronomers, somebody called the Abbe Picard, who wrote an, a treaty of treaties on leveling, how to move the earth so that you always had a view at the end of an avenue. And under Le Nôtre was an army of gardeners planting, raking, removing dead leaves, trimming topiary into new shapes, who we will see always on the edge of pictures. This is by Pierre Patel. Almost all the pictures I'm going to show you are in the Musée de Versailles, in the Palace of Versailles. This is about 1670. The king is arriving with a full escort of guards and grooms on the right. He hasn't yet enlarged the Palace of Versailles, but he's already started working on the garden. And you see the huge canal, which still exists, stretching into the horizons of the Ile de France. And here is an early print of the canal, and often there were boats on the canal, gondolas sent by the Doge of Venice, or indeed sailing ships, which you can see here. They were sometimes used to try out new forms of vessel. Here it is again, as it is now. And some of the first changes he did were to install a menagerie. This is the menagerie, which no longer exists in a corner of the Petit Parc of Versailles. It was full of rare animals like ostriches, cranes. An elephant was sent by the Queen of Portugal in 1668, a tigress by the Sultan of Morocco in 1682. And to the left of the 
garden is one of the most extraordinary buildings in Versailles, the underground orangery below a terrace, which he created in the 1670s and um, designed by Jules Hadouin Mossa, his great architect. It could house a thousand or more orange and lemon trees in winter, as it still does. Orange trees, of course, were very rare in Northern Europe then, a symbol of luxury. And the main gallery is so long and tall, twice the length of the Galerie des Glaces, that it was compared by an English visitor to the naves of so many churches put together. And ambassadors from Siam said that many kings would be happy to live in the orangery as their palace. There you see it again. It's, you have to go down the great steps in on the side of the present garden. And he also created in what is now the town of Versailles, a fruit and vegetable garden. And in those days, France was well in advance of anywhere else in Europe. It was run by Monsieur de la Cantigny. Uh, he wrote a dedication to Louis XIV of instructions on how to use fruit and vegetables. And he actually called the king himself was, and I quote, the most perfect of nature's works. He himself was the finest of all fruits. And apparently in the reign of Louis XIV, there were 700 fig trees producing 4,000 figs a day with names like Grosse Blanche, Petite Blanche and Grosse Violette. And sometimes the king himself would tend trees and bushes with his own hands. And one of John Evelyn's last works was to translate this book into English. Like many Englishmen, he spoke and wrote perfect French and he lived in Paris himself. There you see a, a prince showing the use of the royal, the potager du roi. There it is as it is now in the town of Versailles. You can easily visit it. And it wasn't just a power statement, Louis XIV's garden. Of course, creating the canal, uh, leveling bits of earth, and producing new avenues, that's saying how great and grand he and the French court were. But it's also above all used for pleasure. And the first great entertainment of, uh, at Versailles is in 1664, Les Plaisirs de l'Île Enchantée. Um, plays were put on, feasts were given in the park at night. He's, he's turning night into day. There you see a fountain. There you see an example of the parties in 1664, the king, uh, the royal family under a baldachin and the court watching and spectators further off. And then there's a banquet in the garden at night, showing the use of garden for divertissement, for entertainments. Here you see food being brought in. And the French court was so relaxed or disobedient that there were food scrambles after the court had finished eating when they could watch uh, spectators, members of the public rushing for food themselves. And then fireworks were also part of the entertainment. The best fireworks in Europe were used to entertain the king's guests and again to turn night into day. France was at the forefront of the technology of fireworks. There you see again the fifth day. And there are more entertainments in 1668 and 1674, you see the, the whole park would be illuminated at night. The public would be let in. And sometimes these celebrated his conquests. And you see, this is Les Fêtes de l'Amour et de Bacchus. This is a play by Molière and it's celebrating love. 
as many other entertainments in the Park of Versailles did. The pleasures to which love bids us are the most charming of life. You must enjoy them when you can. You don't have them whenever you want them. Um, and here is another sign of the gardens being created under the sign of love. This is the entrance to the labyrinth. And on the left is Cupid, god of love. On the right is Aesop. And there are many other plays like Le, Le Triomphe de l'Amour or Les Amants Magnifiques. And I'm now going to show you a series of pictures of the Park of Versailles by somebody called Jean Cotel. They are now hanging in the Grand Trianon and they show the spirit of the Park of Versailles. Here you see, this is the entry to the labyrinth with cupids. They're living in a sort of world of classical mythology. They're reconnecting to the classical age through gardens and through sculpture. In fact, the intention of Versailles, it's not, real, it's not only a power statement, it's also to show that France can have palaces and gardens as good as those of modern Rome or ancient Rome. It's trying to catch up with Italy. Here you see the labyrinth with Diana and the nymphs in the foreground. Here you see the amphitheater of Psyche. Psyche, the goddess of love, is in the foreground. Here you see the Bosque de l'Etoile, where Arethusa is changed into a fountain. Again, figures from classical mythology. Here you see the Galerie des Antiques. It no longer exists, but it was lined with ancient sculpture. Again, showing they're as good as ancient Rome. And this picture is particularly interesting because it shows gentlemen and ladies strolling around. It shows how the garden was used and indeed with wheelchairs clearly available to members of the court because the park of Versailles is one of the largest in Europe. Here it is again. And here is a detail showing women could walk in the park, sometimes unescorted, and it's all quite relaxed. Above all, the park doesn't have the same rules of etiquette and behavior as the interior of the palace. Here you see the palace, this is around 1680. It's not yet reached its full size, but the park is full of people talking, strolling, admiring the sights. And here is Louis XIV, about 1680. The palace is being expanded. This is also in the Musée of Versailles by Pierre Patel. And he's inspecting the reservoirs, the reservoirs to the right and left of him, because the supply of water at Versailles was and was never very good and still isn't very good. So you can only turn on the fountains for a few hours at a time. And here is the park and garden and palace at its full extent, a bird's eye view by Israel Silvestre about 1685. You see the vast extent of the garden in front of the palace. Here it is again with fountains playing in front of the palace. The, these are the bosquets which we're seeing in the pictures which are still there and are open to the public of the days of the Grand Zoo. There it is again. This is the orangery on the left under the South Terrace with the great staircase which you go down in order to visit it. And here is a plan of Versailles at the end of his reign, about 1715. It's one of the most extraordinary designs for living ever created. The Petit Parc is about 700 hectare. The Grand Parc about, this is the Petit Parc within this wall. The Grand Parc outside is about 
uh, four times that. And they were full of game for the king to shoot. This is Versailles, this is the Great Canal, and this is Trianon. This is the orangery on the, on the left. So you had a menagerie, you had parks, you had hunting nearby, you had horses, you had entertainment, music, the theater in the park, as well as everything that's going on in the palace. That is one reason why courtiers at Versailles never complain of boredom as they did at Windsor or Vienna. And now we're back to the same series by Jean Cotel, the Bassin de Neptune and the Bassin du Dragon, which are to the right of the palace, absolutely marvelous Baroque fountains still in existence today. Uh, the king sometimes used soldiers to dig aqueducts to try and get better water supply for Versailles when there's peace. And Vauban, his great engineer, who was a moderating influence, criticized the king for trying to surpass the Roman Empire while ruling only a tenth of the size of the empire. The king will be accountable to all nations and to posterity, but still he went on changing um, his gardens. Cons his great re relaxation was to change his gardens and the sculpture in them and the fountain of the dragon which you can see here, when the water is flowing well, reaches 88 feet in height. So it's one of the highest in Europe. Here is the Bassin de Lancelade, which is still there. It's a giant who challenged heaven and is being crushed. Here is the Bosque de la Galerie d'eau, the gallery of water with Narcissus looking at himself in the water. Here is a picture showing a, a, a sculpture of triumphant France at the end and the prisoners are ch enchained by flowers. Here is a view of the right hand side of the palace and please notice the little figures of gardening cupids on the sand here. Amour jardinier, raking the sand. Here's another view, of the three fountains, which are still there today. The grove of domes with a famous sculpture of Apollo served by nymphs. We'll be seeing that later. The colonnade, the colonnade as it is today with a great sculpture by Girardin of the abduction of Proserpina by Pluto. Again, they are plunged into um, classical mythology. Here is the ballroom, which still exists today, where often at night in good weather, there would be dances. Here it is again. And today, sometimes concerts are given or performances of plays in the gardens of Versailles, because uh, until COVID, it was very much a living palace with entertainments almost every evening of the year. And Louis XIV filled his palace, his palace garden, his palace and the gardens with sculpture. He's trying to show that French sculpture is as good as Roman and Italian. And here is a masterpiece by Girardin showing Apollo served by the nymphs uh, from the 1670s. It's in a grotto. Here is again the abduction of Proserpina, 1680s. Uh, the only sculpture in the garden showing Louis XIV himself. There's a, far too many images of him inside the palace. We get a break in the garden showing that it was in fact 
a much less formal space. This is by Slots, and it shows the fame of the king. Here is another sculpture by Slots showing Aristeus and Proteus, scenes from classical mythology, a very white marble against the green of the hedges. This is Ganymede and the eagle, which is about to take him to heaven. This is a sculpture by Ouzo showing a man known as Le Colérique, or the angry man. And here is a sculpture by Pierre Puget, now removed to the Louvre of Perseus and Andromeda. I think it shows the mastery of French sculptors inspired by Louis XIV and the endless orders for more sculpture for the gardens that the government would put through. And now we're going to another area of the park, Trianon, which again shows the private, less formal side of Louis XIV. This is the original Trianon called the Trianon de Porcelaine, which was really a meeting place for the king and his mistress, Madame de Montespan, lined with Delft porcelain. Then it was demolished by 1686 to seven, and the king himself designed a new villa, the Grand Tri Trianon, then known as Trianon, with pink Languedoc marble columns, and it's one floor only, it's very original, it's quite Italian, and it was a place to retreat from Versailles. And in the reign of Louis XIV, it was surrounded by flowers. The king loved flowers as well as sculpture. He himself had been compared to an immortal flower whose perfume scented all Europe, to a sunflower, to an orange tree, or of course, to a lily. And for Trianon, he imported tuberoses, hyacinths, and jonquil from Toulon, Normandy, Marseille, and he sent botanists all around the Middle East to search for rare bulbs. And in 1686, 20,000 jonquil bulbs were sent to Trianon from Toulon, and 20,000 narcissus bulbs arrived from England. Potted plants would be changed outside Trianon. Sometimes the scent, and this is confirmed by letters of the time as well as memoirs, sometimes the king and all the court were forced to leave the garden and go back into Trianon by the smell of the tuberoses because the smell was so strong. And Trianon was his personal creation, but there was here you see it at the time with Zephyr and Flora in front of it. Another picture showing Trianon and the gardens around it and stretching very far. There's also many magnificent sculptures still in the gardens today. And Trianon was then, courtiers could come to Trianon. But the other retreat, Marly, northeast of Versailles, which no longer exists, you could only go to by invitation. It was the king's private paradise where he revealed his inner bohemian. It's built 1679 to 1685. There's a huge water machine which raised water from the Seine in order to fill the fountains. And the main royal pavilion there is surrounded by 12 pavilions for courtiers. Relative informality, courtiers, male courtiers could keep their hats on their heads in the presence of the king. There were very few rules of etiquette. And the king ended up spending at least a third of the year at Marly, getting away from Versailles and business. And in Marly, in theory, his time was devoted to pleasure. Here you see it again, a later picture about 1720 by Pierre Denis Martin. They're all at the Museum of Versailles. And 
you see here the famous Chevaux de Marly, which I'll be showing you later, sculptures by Quasivaux. And this is called the basin. It was a piece of water specifically to, in, to wash your horse in. Here are the Chevaux de Marly. This is Mercury riding Pegasus. It's been long removed to, there are copies in Paris and the original's been removed to the Louvre. The Cour Marly in the Louvre has some of the sculpture from Marly. And this is Fame riding Pegasus. And Madame, his sister-in-law, very critical of the king. Nevertheless, she says when these sculptures were placed in 1702 in Marly, that they were mo the most beautiful sculptures in the world, guarding the entrance to the most beautiful gardens in the world. Here's another, a groom restraining a horse. Another picture of Marly. And now there are these some drawings of the gardens of Marly, probably 1714, anonymous. There's a book has been published reproducing these drawings. There were about a hundred rooms, garden rooms, you could walk from one to the other. And this is a fountain of the Enfant du Couchant, the children of sunset. And please note the golden carp swimming in the pond. The king loved watching carp, but carp need mud. So unfortunately, many of them died because the king insisted on clear water so he could see them. This is the river, which Louis XIV himself designed above the royal pavilion. You see these avenues going endlessly round the gardens of Marly. The a fountain called Les Nappes, a room with sculpture called Parnassus, other uh, gardens round Parnassus, and some of these rooms would have games like early versions of croquet or swings or slides. This is Marly as it is today. Everything went, it was destroyed, it was pulled down after the revolution by a building demolition gang. And so now this is 1688, a picture by Etienne Algra. The garden has expanded, the palace has expanded, the king is beginning to enjoy it. Um, and by the way, Marly was reserved for the court, but in 1708, when the king needed a loan, the most powerful banker in France, Samuel Bernard, was invited there and given the great honor of being shown round in person by the king himself. Normally reserved, the king had a flow of words because he needed a loan and he did get the loan on better terms than he expected. Here is a view of the northern part of the garden urns and sculpture everywhere. The king is in the middle. And what is interesting is that even in Versailles, some of the gentlemen wear hats on their heads in the presence of the king, which is a very unusual breach of etiquette. And there are ladies in the party too. Um, and the king even wrote a guidebook to his own gardens called Manière de montrer les jardins à Versailles in a very dry, commanding tone, turn left at Flora or turn right at the statue of Apollo and so on. But he did bother to write it himself and to change it as he placed more statues and sculptures in his garden. Here is a view of the orangery by Algrin. The orange trees are out, or are they? And most of them are still inside. It must be winter. And here is the king in old age. This is the Bassin d'Apollon, Apollo riding his chariot, riding the horses of the sun. It's 1713, and by now, really quite ill, He's using a 
wheelchair to go round his own garden. And he and Queen Anne, once peace had been made, would exchange gifts. And Louis XIV's gift to Queen Anne, who also was in bad health, was another wheelchair. And it shows the different roles the king played in that he much preferred being alone in his gardens, giving orders uh, to his gardeners without the public being there. And he knew that the public damaged the sculptures and damaged some of the hedges, but he always in the end let them back in. He, he felt overwhelmed by la canaille, as Danjo, the diarist, called it, coming from Paris, damaging the statues and vases. However, in 1704, he ordered the fences to be removed from the bosquet and to let everybody in, because that was part of being king of France, to be publicly accessible to his subjects, to be almost always on show, except when he retreated to Marly. And not only Versailles, Trianon and Marly, but all the area around Paris is in this reign becoming one vast park and garden. It's under Louis XIV that the Champs-Élysées are laid out. And there was an originally a plan to have an avenue connecting them all the way to Saint-Germain, to the west of Paris, which still has the magnificent terrace designed by Le Nôtre above Paris. This is the king hunting at Meudon, which is a royal palace between Versailles and Paris. Most of it was burnt in 1871 during the Franco-Prussian War. This is the Chateau of Choisy to the east of Paris. It too no longer exists, but it, this shows the Louvois and La Rochefoucauld families in the park of Choisy. And it's, it's a very badly damaged picture, but I included it because it shows how they used the garden. They're actually sitting on the grass. Some gentlemen are in chairs, but most people are sitting on the grass. So they did know how to relax. And this is a picture also by Pierre Denis Martin, the great landscape artist of the rain, showing the machine de Marly, the biggest single machine of its day. It raised water from the river Seine to the hills above. And then this aqueduct was built to take water to water the fountains of Marly. So they could play for much longer than the fountains of Versailles. The king is consciously defying nature. He's showing that he can master even the water supply for his gardens. And this was became one of the sites of Paris, but it no longer exists now. Though some of the uh, signs of where the machine was can be seen in the forest. And here is another chateau of one of the king's courtiers, the Chateau de Jouvisy, again by Pierre Denis Martin. You can see this in the V and A. You see how even quite a small chateau has a very elaborate garden with avenues, fountains, lakes, and so on. This may be Louis XIV himself visiting a courtier. This chateau no longer exists. It was bombed in 1944. I wonder what happened to the garden. Probably that too has gone. Here is another chateau of a minister, the minister Maurepas called Pontchartrain. This picture was sold at Sotheby's in 2019. This has not been open to the public for many, many decades. Again, its destiny is not known. The great Palace of Fontainebleau, one of the finest palaces in France, southeast of Paris, where the king went for every hunting season. Again, he had a very elaborate garden there with a very long canal. And the court used to promenade round the canal in the evening. Fontainebleau is 
well worth a visit, far fewer people than at Versailles and really better furniture. And here is another vanished palace, the Chateau of Saint-Cloud above on a hill looking to the east towards Paris. This was lived in by the king's brother, Monsieur Duc d'Orléans. He, <coughs> he expanded and built the palace here. Again, it was destroyed during the Franco-Prussian War. Uh, please note again the very elaborate gardens, the gardeners raking in the foreground. There would have been an, an army of gardeners in each of these palaces and the fountain, which still exists, this lower garden still exists to a certain extent and the fountain and the park still exists, but not in the condition you see it in this picture. So even the brother of the King of France lived in a palace much larger than most European monarchs palaces. And next to this palace, there were guards barracks and they are shortly going to become a new Musée du Grand Siècle. And um, it wasn't just imitated around Paris. Louis XIV's garden style was imitated throughout Europe. French gardens were more popular than French politics. This is the palace Hetlou in the Netherlands, built by his enemy, William III of Orange, later King of England, but he, he's used French artists, architects, and gardeners. And here is Hampton Court around 1703 by Kniff. And again, you see some influence of, of Louis XIV. And in fact, his ambassador, Lord Portland, 1698, during a brief period of peace between the two monarchs, the ambassador was shown all round the gardens by Louis XIV himself. He went to Marly, to Meudon. He, he poo-pooed Louis XIV's tulips, assuring William III that his were far better, but he did call Marly one of the finest gardens in the world, and Meudon the garden with the best position in the world. So there was a Europe of gardens, even hostile monarchs would swap ideas about gardens. And in fact, at this time, uh, William III is thinking of building his own Trianon along the River Thames and making huge waterworks in Bushy Park, which part of which still exist today. Obviously he was planning great things in Bushy and Hampton Court, but he died in 1702. This is Chatsworth in Derbyshire, one of the largest country houses in England. And the garden then was in the French style. In fact, the palace, the, the house itself is partly influenced by the pavilion at Marly. And it is frescoed by a Frenchman, Louis Laguerre. And Jean Huet supervises the laying out of the gardens for the Duke of Devonshire in 1687 to 1707. And many people thought the fountains, the flow of water in the fountains was better at Chatsworth than at Versailles. Here is a picture by Jan Sieberex of Chatsworth in those days with statues and fountains. Um, everybody went to Versailles who could in times of peace the English had a cult of Versailles. No foreign nation imitated Versailles more often or praised it more in the travel books by Martin Lister and many others. They all say it's the best garden in the world, the finest palace. And they try to go to whenever there are wedding festi festivals in Versailles. And this is the garden of Herrenhausen of the future George I of England outside Hanover, an enemy of Louis XIV, but again, his garden style is in part influenced by Versailles. And he tried to claim that his 
fountains in his garden were higher than Louis XIV's. And here is Schleisheim, the garden of Louis XIV's ally, the Elector of Bavaria. Also, it was laid out by a Frenchman, Dominique Girard. And here is another magnificent French style garden, Peterhof outside St. Petersburg, 1713 to 1725. Peter the Great did in fact visit Versailles in 1717 and Marly, he behaved abominably for his hosts, but he clearly picked up some ideas there. In fact, a pavilion in the park is called Marlia. And so even a monarch as allegedly simple in his tastes as Peter the Great still wanted a Versailles and a Versailles style garden. And his fountains had a far better supply of water than Louis XIV's. This is La Granja outside Segovia in Spain, laid out in 1721 to 1734 for Louis XIV's grandson, Philip V, King of Spain. Again, it's designed by a Frenchman, René Cassin, and sculptures and urns. And the garden at Versailles went on in the 18th century, frequently used for royal weddings, nighttime fairs, 1729, 1731, 1751. But the, it was also um, many strange things happen in the garden at night. Courtiers were, were exiled from Versailles for having committed abominations in the bosque. And the greatest party of all at Versailles, perhaps, was the illuminations and fireworks in the park um, in 1770 for the wedding of the Dauphin and Marie Antoinette. May 1770, um, a lot of people came from England just to admire it. It later inspired Edmund Burke, a famous passage saying how marvelous Versailles had been and that Marie Antoinette was an image of beauty. Amazingly, in the accounts of the celebrations, there's no disorder, no crimes, or they aren't recorded. Everything seems quite peaceful. Equally amazingly, Louis XV and the Dauphin stayed up in the palace. Marie Antoinette significantly wanted to go down into the garden to see the illuminations more closely, but the royal family, the French royal family, disdained even to go and see it. And the, a courtier writing called the Duc de Cruy said that made my heart bleed. So already the royal family is taking its distance from popular festivities, which Louis XIV had never entirely done. Louis XVI, uh, there's a storm, the trees have to, the park has to be replanted. Here are some pictures by Hubert Robert showing Marie Antoinette in the park, admiring the horses, the sculptures of horses. Again, in the park, as trees are being cut down and replanted, this is 1777, commissioned by Louis XVI. Again, showing the informality of life at Versailles. Uh, people are strolling around, children are playing on seesaws. And here you see Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette themselves in the park. However, gardens can be subversive, as I'm sure you know. And Marie Antoinette's love of going into the garden at night was, this is a party she gave for her brother Joseph II in the gardens of the Petit Trianon, which has been added on under Louis XV, a small pavilion, which Louis XVI then gave to his wife, Marie Antoinette. They inspired malevolent gossip because nobody was sure what was happening under cover of dark. She also gave another party in 1782 for the visiting Grand Duke Paul of 
Russia, and another 1784 for Gustavus III of Sweden. And these inspired um, the gossip which led to the Cardinal de Rohan believing that the queen at night in the garden of Versailles had given him a rose as a sign that she wanted a diamond necklace. And so the affair of the diamond necklace exploded in 1785. The gardens uh, subverted the public image of the monarchy. And in 1789, the court was forced to leave its paradise of Versailles. And I hope I've shown that the gardens were at least as important to the Bourbons as the palace. Thank you very much. Oh. Philip, thank yes. you um, so much for an absolutely fascinating talk there. Um, I feel there's so much more that uh, we ought to know about it, but you've given us an amazingly brief but um, very, very full and complete picture um, of this extraordinary place and the, the amazing effect that it must have had on those visitors who came there. Um, we have got a few questions, but um, I just wanted to ask you, you mentioned that Mali was open, was open by invitation only. Um, yeah. Did that mean that Versailles and the Trianon were also um, just basically open to the public? Could anybody just turn up and wander around? Yes, if as long as you were well dressed, you could get into the park at Versailles from morning to dusk. The soldiers would let you in. And if you were well dressed, you could also go around the palace. And there are descriptions, even when the king and his son were away, you could see their private apartments and private art treasures. So it, it, is, it was more open then than it is now. And Trianon was only open to courtiers if the king was there, i.e. people recognized by the, by the guards at the gate. Marly was never open to the public except from the reign of Louis XV. If the king wasn't there, sometimes the public was let in to admire it. Right, okay, thank you. Um, I was also fascinated by these incredible fountains that you talk of being 88 feet high. Yes. Um, you explained how, how the water worked at uh, Marly, but in Versailles, it was very flat. How did they get that incredible pressure? Yep. Well, that's a very good question. I, I'm not a water engineer. I can't really explain. But they have underground reservoirs. There's an underground Versailles under the park. Yes. Full of water. And it's because they're so rarely flow, the fontanier, the fountain men, know how to turn them on at the same time, which I think increases the pressure. And in fact, he built so many reservoirs and aqueducts that there was a, a quite an adequate supply of water by the end. But it was much criticized by people in his reign, like Madame de Sévigné, that, uh, and even the Marquis de Sorche, who's a court official, says at the beginning, this is a miserable dump and there's not enough water. Right. And he's been building, he's planning this aqueduct with three regiments working on it in 1684, coming from Maintenon, bringing even more water, div diverting part of the river Eure, E-U-R-E, but it, it never really worked. Right, right. Um, it's, it's quite interesting to hear something about Louis XIV that doesn't mention much about his military campaigns and conquests. Do you, do you think creating a garden was another form of conquest for him? I think possibly the Grande Perspective and the, the canal and the earthworks. He's sort of conquering nature, saying, look, I've made this spectacular garden and park, even at Versailles, which really had been quite difficult. But that's only part of the story because he clearly loved satisfying his aesthetic impulses with different colors of flowers, different flowers, importing exotic flowers, 
rearranging sculpture, putting it in different places, commissioning sculpture, get, getting even antique sculptures from Smyrna or Libya. Um, so it's also a way of expressing his desire to divert the court and foreigners and the public. Yeah. It's not just conquest, it's also the desire to please and to impress and to restore the reputation of French sculptors and, and gardeners because yeah. everybody was still under the, the, the spell of Rome, Tivoli, the Villa d'Este, Frascati and so on. Yes. And did it work? Did he actually encourage foreign rulers to imitate his gardens at Versailles, do you think? Well, when he's speaking to William III's ambassador and charming him and showing him Marley and so on, yes, he did. But I don't, I don't think he directly encouraged them. He's just making Versailles the best and then they, of their own impulse, they want French gardeners as well as French clothes or French dance steps or French music or French opera. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the Marley, um, the, the image you showed us of the, uh, the pair, well, one of the pair, the horses at Marley being restrained by grooms. Yes. Uh, interested me because, uh, do you know where they are? Because they're, they're amongst the most imitated forms of sculpture that I know of in the 19th century. They're bronzes of them are absolutely everywhere you go. I didn't, I didn't know that. Hmm. I wonder why in the 19th century. Yes, they're all in the Cour Marley in the Louvre, where the originals have been removed for safety so they're not damaged by the weather right right but, but the copies at the entrance of the champs elysees hmm. they have become extremely sort of well known through all the reproductions and copies which is interesting um philip somebody um giuliano asked earlier on about the fate by moliere um and what was the theater location in which it was presented oh it was in the park in one of the bosque I, I forget which Bosque itself. It's in the open air in May, so they're very confident of the weather. Mm -hmm. That's one of the functions of Versailles to act as an outdoor theater and an outdoor ballroom, an outdoor uh, concert room. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, Lucy Abel Smith's asking how, how were the buildings lit, um, particularly in terms of the fireworks? Th thousands of candles placed by the gardeners and the servants all over the um, park. So it would take days of preparation, actual, actual candles, and then how they lit them at the same time, I have no idea. Pe people were impressed at the spontaneity. The king could give a signal, Louis XV, from the, up in the palace at Versailles, and suddenly everything is lit. Fireworks explode, and no wonder people came from England and other countries just to see these celebrations. Right. So yes, I mean, quite quite an organisational feat to get yes. all the to go off at the same and, time. And the, the Duchess of Northumberland, who's there in 1770, whose diary is very very good. She she says, it's not only the most magnificent thing I've ever seen, but very well organised. The, the court worked quite well, maybe better than the government. <laughs> Fascinating. Um, Philip, uh, Chloe Bennett has asked, um, she's saying, how can we access the drawing of the potager? This was a question earlier on re relating to the Versailles town potager you showed us. I yes. Well, you, you go to the book by La, La Cantini, Q-U-I-N-T-I-N-I-E, mm -hmm. and that will be in the British Library and in, and in, um, large French libraries and it's a, an engraving from that book and in fact I found it on the internet. Right, <laughs> lovely. Um, I, I was also very interested to ask you Philip, what happened in the winter to the gardens? Were, did, were they shut down or did they still operate? Did people still visit them? No, the people still visited them and but some of the sculptures were boxed up to protect them because there were very, very harsh winters in 1708 and 1709 when mm. people died of cold and the, the, the wine froze in the bottle on your table. Um, but they weren't 
shut up because the king still goes out to look at his sculptures or to or to take exercise because he was an exercise fanatic. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's interesting. Um, Giuliano's asked us, um, were the fountains running continuously during Louis XIV's time there? No, they, I'm sorry, I didn't make that clear. They only ran for two or three hours at a time and only when the king is looking at them. So he comes round a corner and the Fontanier whistle to each other and the fountains are turned on. And then as he leaves, they're turned off, but they're put on for very grand, important foreign visitors like the Russian ambassadors or the Queen of England or the Elector of Bavaria, then, or the Siamese ambassadors, then they're put on for two or three hours as the party goes round the park. Mm -hmm. But this but, is a great but, honor. Normally that it's the dry, as they are now. They're only put on certain Sundays in the summer. They still work, do they? Yes. All oh, right, that's an interesting. And Versailles is, is sort of com coming back to life things are better organized. There's more music in the park now. There's more events in the evening in the palace. And more is known now about the sculpture and the, how the garden functioned. Yeah, hmm. fascinating. Um, I think just one more question, Philip, we've got time for. The, the orangery, um, which yes. was fascinating, did it actually produce fruit or was it just for sort of show? I mean that far north in Europe, could anybody grow an orange? Because they, they weren't, they didn't look as, to me as though it was a sealed, um, a sealed chamber. No. Well, that's a very good question. I, I'm, sh I'm sure they didn't produce yeah. fruit and they were mainly for show because they were so e exotic and luxurious for, for the time. Yes, yeah, exactly. Um, uh, or they, produ they produced fruit that wasn't edible. Right. Um, yes. Um, Julie has, uh, Giuliano has said, uh, I noticed that you didn't include the Petit Hameau in your talk. Of course, I understand that they were uh, built later, uh, during a later time. But is there any quick story or insight you can give us about that? Well, it's just been restored and it's open after a long period of restoration. And I mean, Marie Antoinette wasn't the only person to have a petit amo. It was a fashion and people dressing up as shepherds and shepherdesses, I and mean, they'd done that for hundreds of years. But it did, it did arouse criticism at the time because there were people in real amo just outside the park of Versailles who, who were living very badly and they were very poor. And the queen was criticized. And above all, the difference with Trianon under Marie Antoinette and before is that Louis says had given it to her. She controlled access and the public was not admitted. And there is a document where her gardener in chief says, when your majesty is away from Trianon, will you allow certain members of the public to come and look at the gardens? And next to that in pencil, she has written non. <laughs> Lovely, yes. <laughs> um, we've got time for just one more comment, Philip. Um, Edward Martin's saying, at La Grandia, if I pronounce that right, you follow the water around the garden from the top to the bottom. Do you know about that? No. no. I, years since I've, I've been, I've not properly explored the garden. I'm, I'm sure other monarchs were more sensible and ensured they had good water supplies. I think La Grandia is quite near a hill or mountain. All oh, right. Because yeah. Caserta has a wonderful long fountain, um, mm. plenty of water, and of course, Peterhof. It's only Louis XIV who had a passion for Versailles, who never slept in Paris after 1671. So that's 40 years he never slept in his own capital city. And he insisted on making his main residence at Versailles against the advice of his great minister Colbert and the criticism of the courtiers who said oh, Versailles is a, a favorite without merit. Right. <laughs> um, uh, 
uh, on that note, Philip, um, I think I'm going to have to wrap this up because of time. But what a fascinating talk. Thank you so much. Um, it could have gone on for hours more. But uh, I, for one, I've, I have started your book and I'm now encouraged to pick it up with greater vigour and, um, and get it finished. Thank you so much. I'm now going to hand you back to Madeline, if I may. Many thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Um, just to say, finally, before, before we go, if you'd like to now unmute yourselves um, and perhaps give Philip a round of applause for a fascinating and wonderfully illustrated talk. So please unmute yourself. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.